Today we're going to talk about SaaS and getting started with SaaS. Um, my name's Tiffany. I uh, am the creative director uh, at a company called Coldfront Labs. Um, if you want to get the slides for this presentation, you can later. Uh, they're at bit.ly slash start dash with dash SaaS. Um, so, uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Tiffany underscore TSE. So if you have any questions or you want to follow up after, um, just send me a tweet and I will respond. Um, so who am I? Well, I uh, do a bunch of different things. I wear a bunch of different hats. Um, I'm from Ottawa, uh, and I am a teacher there. I teach at Algonquin College, um, and I'm also uh, a creative director um, slash front end developer slash designer um, at Coldfront Labs. Uh, and you'll see a few different presentations by a couple different people from Coldfront Labs today if, um, if you uh, sort of wander the halls. Um, <laughs> half the company's here. Which is, yeah, they're all in here. Um, and yeah, so I teach in the graphic design program at uh, Algonquin College uh, in Ottawa. And I teach um, web development to graphic designers. Um, so I'm teaching front end code, uh, stuff that's definitely more technical to people who are very visual. Um, and my background, um, I actually did a bachelor degree in fine arts um, and then went back to school for interactive multimedia and learned how to code and do that kind of stuff in college. Uh, and then sort of taught myself um, through working on different projects and just talking with people and scouring the internet for things. Um, I also run the Ottawa chapter of Ladies Learning Code. Um, and uh, Ladies Learning Code is a non-for-profit. It's nationwide uh, in Canada. We have chapters all across, in, all across Canada in all of the major cities. Um, and we actually have National Learn to Code Day, which is going to be on Python, um, coming up on September 27th. Um, so there is a Montreal chapter. So if you're from Montreal, um, we welcome you to come out to uh, the Montreal events. Uh, if you're from Ottawa um, or Toronto, there are chapters in those cities as well. So what are we going to do today? Well, first of all, we're going to talk about how we got here, um, not to Montreal and not to Drupal Camp, but more specifically, um, how we came to the idea of preprocessors and what is a preprocessor and why is it useful to us. Um, and then we're going to talk about specifically SAS as a preprocessor, a CSS preprocessor, and how um, that syntax actually looks um, and how to actually implement it into your workflow. So what do you need to get started and what are those components. So um, the types of file names and extensions, uh, any config files that you might need, um, compilers specifically. Uh, we'll go through syntax. Um, we're going to talk about how to actually convince your team that it's worthwhile doing, uh, which is definitely the hardest thing to do if you work in a larger organization. It's fine if you're independent and you're working on smaller projects. It's a lot easier to implement new things into workflow. But if you work in a larger company, it's a lot harder to implement new things into your workflow. So we're going to talk about how to convince your team um, to go with SAS uh, or some other CSS preprocessor. I'm not. I'm pretty agnostic. I, I, not, I use SAS every day, uh, but, and that's just because of the base theme uh, that we, uh, we use Zen uh, at our company. We base off of Zen, we sub-theme off of Zen, uh, which uses SAS. But if you are a bootstrap person and you like less, cool. You're using preprocessor, I'm happy. Um, and then we're going to talk about common misconceptions, so things that would come up generally at a meeting when you're trying to convince people how to use SAS or to use SAS or some kind of CSS preprocessor, what people often will say um, as reasons not to use. So we'll talk about those things and how to sort of combat that. Um, and ideally to get this or some form of a CSS preprocessor into your workflow. All right, so how did we get here? As we code and as our sites and content management systems uh, get more complicated, we have created abstractions to make things easier. We already use abstractions of HTML. All of you are here today because we use Drupal in some capacity. Drupal uses PHP as a server side. Um, server side. So realistically, that is an abstraction of HTML. None of us, at least I hope, write or go into full HTML files to change contact, informa or contact information on a contact us page anymore. Most people use some kind of abstraction of a lot of the front end languages um, that exist. So 
if we look at front end as sort of a spectrum, we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. With HTML, server and client side templates are that form of abstraction. We've created ways to make creating websites easier for us by creating header and footer templates. So we don't have to, if we want to make one change, it can sort of streamline across our whole site. We don't have to go into hundreds of HTML files and change a single word, right? When it comes to JavaScript, JavaScript already has abstractions. We have variables and functions and methods, and different things that we use already in JavaScript. Um, so it is already pre-built in. But with CSS, for the longest time and up until even recent, like in the last few years, we've been totally cool with just going into a CSS file and editing giant CSS files and giant um, pieces of content uh, that aren't really that efficient and that are essentially the exact same thing that the browser reads, right? So CSS preprocessors to the rescue. Don't get excited. Okay. Um, CSS preprocessors are meant to make your life easier. They're not meant to make your life harder. Um, yes, of course, there is definitely uh, some work involved whenever you're trying to learn something new. Um, but I think it's worth it. And I've had to recently work on projects where um, it was straight up CSS, and I've been using SAS for the last couple years, and it was painful, to say the least. Um, I felt like I was writing code for hours that I could have written in 10 minutes um, just because I was writing it in CSS versus SAS. Um, so there's definitely reasons to use it. We'll go into that more. Um, so what is SAS and how does it kind of work? Well, we have a SAS file and that gets compiled into a CSS file and that gets compiled into a web, or that is basically turned into a web page or served up by the web page, right? So we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's what the web page and the web browser, the rendering engine reads, right? SAS as a framework or CSS preprocessors in general are in this sort of build process, right? You're building locally and then you're putting it on a server or you're sending it to a server of some kind. And so your SAS files get compiled into CSS and you would never have your SAS files on production, right? And the browser is sort of that in between between a CSS file and a web page. SAS can concatenate and compress CSS for you. So if you're looking for reasons to use a CSS preprocessor, this is one of the biggest and most useful reasons, right? Chances are um, you hopefully are working in multiple CSS files, uh, depending on how um, your site's set up. And already your website is probably making multiple requests. If you're not using a single, uh, if you're using multiple CSS files to kind of break up your CSS and make it easier to read and develop on your own, um, SAS can help you concatenate all of those things and put it into one file um, really, really easily, but keep the development side of things um, separate. And so we'll get into that more. So actually talking about what is SAS, what does it stand for, etc. So SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets. Okay. Um, it's one of the most mature, this is like a direct quote from their website, so it's, uh, I'm not, um, yeah, anyway, so SAS is the most mature, stable, and powerful professional grade CSS extension language in the world. This is what they claim on their website. Um, I would say the majority of people that I know would probably use SAS or less or Stylus, um, but most of the people that I talk to use SAS. Um, and there are many processor languages out there, like I've mentioned, um, and they all sort of do the same thing. Uh, they all have really similar concepts, which are rooted in regular sort of object-oriented programming, um, but they have slightly different syntax. We're going to talk about SAS syntax today. Um, just to get a general idea, how many people here are designers? Front-end developer slash designer or themer? Okay. Developer. Cool. How many people have written in a CSS preprocessor before? Try it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're hopefully going to fix that today. 
All right. So when it comes to SaaS specifically, um, when you read online, you go online, you're going to see different versions of SaaS. Um, there was the first version that came out, and the file extension for that is .sass. There's a specific syntax um, with that. Uh, there, the indentation matters, similar to uh, preprocessors like Stylus. Um, and there are, uh, I'll just open this up just to show you guys the difference. But basically, uh, there are two versions of SAS syntax. Um, and of course, I'll just show you guys a quick example here. But, and why would learn SAS? <laughs> so the dot. SASS files or .sass files um, have brackets and semicolons, um, or sorry, have no brackets uh, and no semicolons, which is pretty much the same as stylus, more or less. Um, some of the other syntax is different. Uh, the difference between that and a SCSS file um, was that, first of all, when it first started and CSS preprocessors were coming around, people found it really difficult to sort of jump on the bandwagon. People were like, I already have all this CSS. I have to convert it into this and take out all of these brackets and semicolons to make it work. That's ridiculous. That's too much work for the existing projects that I have. So um, they came up with this other idea. Why don't we make CSS valid syntax? And you can put it in a SAS file, um, but it'll still compile out to CSS. Um, so CSS compiles into CSS in a SAS file. Uh, that sounds really confusing, but I'll, get, I'll show you uh, what I mean. Um, but basically, in SCSS, you still have brackets. You still have, it looks pretty much exactly like CSS, except you have extra little bits of things that you can use, such as variables and mixins. And we'll get into what those things are later. But you have access to the SAS uh, library of uh, tools. So what you really need to know here um, is that SCSS was created um, to solve that problem of people sort of moving from CSS into SAS and making it easier to take existing files and just turn them into SAS files. Um, both compile into CSS. Uh, and to do that, you need a compiler. So like I said, you can write CSS directly into a SAS file. Um, when I say SAS here, I'm talking about .scss. It will just compile directly back into CSS. So when you run it through a compiler, it'll just spit out exactly what you had in the file in the first place. You need to have a compiler such as Compass, Live Reload, um, and I'll talk about other compilers in a second, to actually render that SAS file into CSS. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You're just going to have SAS files on your computer, and nothing's going to happen. Right? Your browser is not going to know what to do with it because it doesn't recognize the extension, and it probably won't recognize a lot of the syntax if you're taking advantage of the SAS syntax. So what is a compiler? A compiler is just an application, whether it's command line or a GUI, that is going to take that SAS file and turn it into CSS for you. Some compilers have live reloading, sort of part of them. Uh, one of the first compilers that was out there, that sort of existed uh, in this sphere was live reload. Uh, it, compiles, it compiles CoffeeScript, SAS, LESS, Stylus, all of these different languages. It's a GUI app that you can install on your computer. It also has, there's also Grunt plugins of it and uh, Ruby gems and all these kind of things. So. Um, Live Reload exists in a lot of different forms, but essentially what it does is it helps to compile those SAS files um, and as well as uh, auto refresh and reload um, the newly compiled styles into uh, your browser for you. So you don't actually have to go and refresh your browser each time you want to see changes. So some apps that you can look up or write down or take a picture of if you want to explore them further, there's Live Reload, there's Koala, Scout, um, CodeKit, Prepose. Prepose has um, auto prefixer built in, if anybody's heard of that. So it auto prefixes all of, it looks at HTML5 please um, and 
looks through their library of uh, what still needs to be prefixed for the browsers that are out there, and then it automatically adds in the prefixes that you need um, for CSS3 properties. Um, and then there's command line compilers. I listed Ruby specific ones, but there are definitely other ones for different languages. So I use Compass, um, and I use Compass uh, as a command line tool um, regularly. Uh, but they also have an application that you can download and use uh, like with a GUI uh, if you're more comfortable with that. And um, it's not only just a compiler, but it also comes with a framework of mixins and uh, other sort of extensions that, of uh, tools that you can use uh, to make writing SAS easier. Um, and some of those include uh, things uh, to prefix um, CSS3 properties that might not actually work in all browsers yet. Okay, so I'm specifically like, going to tie this back to Drupal so that it's not entirely just separate. Um, but with uh, my workflow, I, we use the Zen theme um, and we sub theme off of that uh, to create all of our web application themes and um, website themes. Um, and you'll notice that when you sub theme off of a uh, Drupal theme that uses SAS already, there's probably going to be a config RB file. Um, you'd only need this config RB file if you're using a command line tool to compile. So you have to tell that command line tool what to do. Otherwise, if you're using a GUI, chances are you just have to drag that folder to the GUI and tell it to watch the folder. Um, basically, this config RB file tells your compiler, whatever compiler it is that you're using, um, to watch this folder, where to output the CSS files to, and in what form to output them to. So do I want it compressed? Do I want it expanded? Um, the CSS, I mean, like, do I want it minified or like with comments um, and nice indentation? Um, so that config RB file is automatically in Zen for you. You can go in and change it. Uh, if you're using an app, on like a GUI app on your computer to sort of watch the files and compile for you, that file is usually generated by the app. Um, you might not see it. It might be a totally different format. It might not be in Ruby. Um, but it will generate a file like that in the background for you, and that's how it's watching that folder and understanding uh, where to compile stuff to. Um, and those settings will be in the GUI that you choose. right? So uh, when you drag the folder in, it'll ask you, where do you want the CSS to output? and you'll choose those. Oh, this is why I exited out of this. I was going to show you the file structure in Zen. <laughs> um, so in Zen, I don't know if you guys can see that. It's kind of tiny. Um, but there is a SAS folder, and there is a config RB file. And if I open that config RB file, you can see that it has a CSS directory specified, um, what the SAS directory is, uh, whether or not it, the environment is production or development, and that will determine whether or not um, your SAS is compiled into minified CSS or expanded CSS. Um, and then Fire SAS is another extension of this. Uh, this helps. Um, with mapping. So if you're looking for errors and stuff like that, uh, in the inspector, FireSAS will output uh, comments for you uh, in the output CSS file that gives you lines and file names uh, for where your error might be. So you can turn that on just by uncommenting and commenting like the opposite different things. Uh, again, the compilers will have a GUI for this, so uh, like the compiler apps. So uh, it's up to you how you do it, but you can do it both ways. You'll notice that in most SAS folders or anything that's sort of generated online for you, if you're using sort of a starting SAS setup, um, that uh, there's usually multiple files and multiple folders. And the reason for that is ideally to make your life easier. Um, we're trying to split up your CSS, uh, or your SAS in this case, uh, into manageable pieces. Um, the main parts being you have a SAS file, which has a .scss extension or a .sass extension. And then you have other files that start with underscores that are called partials. 
So let's get into partials. So a partial um, is basically a, a SAS file that's preceded with an underscore. And it basically, that underscore tells the compiler not to compile this into a CSS file. You're going to import this file into another dot .scss file that has no underscore, like leading underscore. And those files that have no leading underscore that aren't partials that are full SAS files, those actually get compiled into CSS. Right? So um, in the case of Zen, I'll just show you guys here. Um, you'll notice there's like layouts and components and print style sheets and all these. All these have a prefix, like an underscore prefix. These are all partial files. All of the only files that don't have the prefix are styles.scss and styles-right-to-left.scss. And those are the only two files, if I go into the CSS directory down here, that actually get, oh, sorry. And then the print, there's probably a print one as well. Oh, print's in there. Interesting. Um, those are the files that comp get compiled into CSS files. So the yep. compiler is just going to detect all of the SAS files? Yeah, so the compiler looks for SAS files that have no underscore prefix, and it will turn those into CSS files for you. You have to specify what folder they're going to get output to, but it'll turn those into CSS files for you. Um, in the styles.scss, uh, it uses what are called import statements to import all of these partials. So realistically, when you open, um, in this case, it's called styles. Sometimes it'll be called base. Sometimes it'll be called, um, I, I haven't really seen, like basically usually it's styles or base. <laughs> uh, but you should just see a bunch of import statements. And like CSS, SAS is read from top to bottom and imported from top to bottom. So if you need to use a font uh, and you've declared it in a typography file, um, but you're using it before you actually import it or declare, uh, using it before you actually uh, define it, it's not going to work. Same way that CSS works, right? So it reads from top to bottom. If you try to use something that you haven't already defined, uh, it's not going to take. Uh, and then inheritance works the same way as CSS as well. If you define something below something previously defined, uh, it'll overwrite it if it's more specific or if it's on the same level, OK? Um, so the order in which you import things does matter. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind, especially when, say, for example, you're styling um, multiple components and some styles aren't taking. You have to think, where are these pieces sort of separated? And have I put them in the right order uh, so that it makes sense? I've said all of these things. OK. Um, Zen uses uh, a best practice called SMACS, which, is, which stands for scalable, whoop, there goes my head, which stands for scalable uh, and modular architecture for CSS. Um, it is uh, a dogma, let's say, uh, of how to organize your CSS and how to um, better make um, SAS files or CSS files uh, more sort of object oriented uh, and portable as well as scalable. Um, this guy is from Ottawa. He actually works at Shopify. Who wrote this? Uh, his name is Snook. Uh, and uh, you can visit this website. There are lots of other sort of um, ideas out there floating around of uh, the best way to organize CSS and how to organize it into modular pieces and where you should initialize files. Um, it's pretty quick if you Google this and type in VS you will see all of the different variations of these kind of uh, ideas and frameworks. The next thing in terms of syntax that we're going to talk about are SAS variables. So just like variables in pretty much any other language, you define them, and then you give them a value. Woo. So variables are placeholders for information that you want to reuse throughout your site. Since most of you guys are developers, I probably don't have to explain how variables work. Um, but with SAS, you define them using a dollar sign. 
So uh, this is an example of a SAS file. Uh, that defines a bunch of font families inside different variables. So uh, it'll give a font family name and then we'll list a bunch of, uh, a, basically a font stack inside. You can also choose to define colors in variables. You can pretty much put anything you want in a variable, realistically. Um, there's different ways that you have to uh, call on that variable uh, based on what information is stored in it. But for the most part, you can just write out the variable name in place of whatever it is uh, that you're putting in. So for example, uh, if I defined a color gray, and then I wanted to use that color in a border uh, that I'm setting on something, I can just write the variable name in place of that color. And the useful part about this is if you define a set of colors or a set of variables at the beginning of your project, uh, it helps with consistency. It also helps uh, maintainability. So all of a sudden, you realize one of those colors that you've used on basically everywhere on your site isn't accessible, doesn't meet the color contrast requirements for WCAG AA. So now you have to go and change it. Well, if you define a variable, you only have to change it in one place. You don't have to do a find and replace. You don't have to search through multiple things. Um, so this is, if you're looking for a reason, this is one of the easiest reasons why you should be using a CSS preprocessor is for variables alone. Next, we'll talk about nesting. So nesting, uh, we nest in HTML, and we nest in all coding languages to make things easier to read. Uh, SAS will let you nest. Uh, your CSS selectors in a way that follows that same kind of syntax and that same sort of mental path and hierarchy. So I might be writing, making a website and I'm typing some CSS and I'm writing box and I'm setting a background color and box A and then setting a, a color for those links that are inside the box and then I want to set a border on, um, on all H2s and then I'm typing box over and over and over again. It's kind of tedious. Uh, we can eliminate that with SAS nesting by just nesting those selectors inside. And this will output that. So it's really similar to how you would set up your HTML or how you, it, it's kind of, like I, at least when I first started doing this, I understood this right away. Like does anybody find this concept kind of difficult? I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory in the sense that anything that's inside box is preceded with a box class, right? One thing that you have to avoid with nesting is nesting more than three layers deep. You want to avoid some kind of nesting inception. I don't know if any of you watch Jimmy Fallon, but this week there's a picture of, I guess Jimmy Fallon has mugs in his house and he has like a bunch of faces and people like in his family. And then Justin Timber like stole one of his mugs and took a picture and sent it to Jimmy. And then Jimmy took a picture of that picture and put it on a mug. And then Justin Timber like <laughs> took another picture. Anyway, um, so <laughs> the point being, you want to avoid nesting too many layers deep. The same way that you wouldn't write a giant selector in CSS, you're not going to nest multiple, 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 multiple times, creating too much specificity and causing yourself sort of headache later on when you want to change something about a specific element because you've just nested it 100 times uh, in your SAS. So if you wouldn't do it in CSS, don't do it in SAS, right? If you're not going to write like um, nav, ul, lia in your CSS to define all links inside your nav element, right? you would probably just write nav A instead of nav U L L I A. Um, then don't write it in your SAS file. Have nav and then just put a, a, a style your link inside the nav, the same way that you would in CSS. We can also nest, um, we can also append nested selectors in SAS using a ampersand. So uh, if header site link is in this case, it's actually the class on the link itself. Um, we can target its hover state and its focus state by putting uh, ampersand in front of those uh, pseudo classes. Okay. And you can do this with um, classes as well, uh, just straight up classes. So if you have a selector that say box, um, but you also have an additional class on um, 
on that div that has a class of box called red, uh, you can write box and then on inside nested, uh, you can write ampersand dot red and so any classes of red that are also on a, the same element as box um, will take those styles. It helps you group things together in and logical groupings sort of help assist in understanding. So uh, again, if we're looking to make our lives easier and our code easier to read, by grouping things together that make sense structurally, it's going to be easier to find stuff, right? You're not going to be searching through a giant CSS file uh, like, and just doing a find to try to figure out where uh, your header styles are. They're all sort of together. Um, and you can do this with media queries too. Right? So we can actually nest our media queries inside the element that we are dealing with. And so all the media queries for that element are inside that selector versus having one giant media query at the bottom and then having to scroll to the bottom of your CSS and then find wherever it is that you're looking for. Now it's contextual or you can make it contextual. You don't have to. You can write it however you used to. But, or you can do it this way. Right? So I'm going to show you a quick demo of how to use, oh, how I use, I should say, um, nesting and variables uh, in a really helpful manner. So there are um, additional uh, like frameworks that you can use, like Breakpoint, that kind of do this for you. I don't think you need a framework for something like this. Uh, this method works totally fine. Um, basically, I'm putting min width media queries inside variables, and then I'm calling on those variables uh, based on when I want to call a media query. So um, for mobile, I have a string inside it, which is only screen and min width 20m. Uh, and when I want to use uh, any of these variables, uh, in a, or want, when I want to call on that media query, I can just write out that variable. You'll notice that the syntax has a hashtag and then a pair of um, bra curly brackets around that variable. Anytime uh, that you are, where is it? OK. Anytime that you are using a variable um, in either a CSS selector or um, in uh, a mixin selector, you need to uh, structure it in this way. That's the syntax. Otherwise, you're going to throw an error when you're, the compiler will throw an error. And it'll just tell you, like, I can't compute this. I don't understand. So um, anytime that you're using a variable, again, inside uh, or for a, a selector, you need to put it inside a hashtag and a pair of curly brackets. If you're using variables inside as properties, um, it's fine. As property values, sorry. If it's the property itself, again, it has to be in the syntax. But if it's the value of that property, it's fine as just the dollar sign. Okay. Um, so, for example, what this does is it just changes the background color of body based on um, the screen width. So it starts off as green, and then it turns to blue, and then it turns to purple. Right? So I set a background color for body, which was green, and then I put in my contextual media queries that are using my variables that I've defined. And it doesn't mean that you can't just, like, if it makes sense, use uh, a regular media query. Um, but this helps for consistency, like if you're using M values and you want sort of all your breakpoints to be really more or less the same, this is really helpful for that. And then it also provides uh, like sort of semantic names for your media queries, which is helpful when you're coding. So, the next thing we're going to talk about uh, are mix-ins. So some things in CSS are tedious to write, uh, especially with CSS3 uh, vendor prefixes and stuff like that. Um, and so we can use mix-ins to actually help um, alleviate some of those declarations. Uh, you can also add uh, pass values to your mix-ins. Mix-ins are more or less like functions. Um, to make them more flexible. Uh, a, again, a good use of uh, mix-in is a vendor prefix. Um, 
if you're using Compass, which uh, ex is a framework that extends sort of the SAS uh, syntax, uh, Compass has a bunch of built-in mix-ins for you. Um, and oftentimes, uh, if you're using uh, a comp Compass as well, um, you just have to look up their documentation and the chances are they probably have an existing um, mix-in that you can use so you don't have to create your own for a CSS3 um, prefix thing. To include a mix-in, you write at include followed by the mix-in name. So I'll just show you what that looks like. So say for example I want to define a button or what my button styles look like. I can set a bunch of styles for that. Um, and put it inside a mixin. And you can think of a mixin as like a multi line multi value variable if you want, if that helps you to sort of understand it. Uh, it's just kind of like a large variable too, right? But that variable can also take arguments. So it's really more like a function. <laughs> um, and then if we want to output those styles, uh, we would write at include on the selector that we want. But if we wanted to make this reusable, which it, it is sort of, but it, we're defining background colors and color of text and that kind of thing, we can pass it arguments. So we can pass different arguments to a mixin and declare those argument variables um, inside as different properties. So I'll just show you what I mean by that. So in this case, uh, I've created a mixin button, which has margin and padding and display border radius, all that kind of stuff. I've actually just uncommented it. Um, and I've set background colors on all these buttons. Um, but if I just uncomment the include, now all of my buttons that have that class now include all of those properties. If I want to make this reusable, what I can do is I can pass uh, the button mix in a property. So in this case, I've just added a hover state as well. You'll notice that the hover states for these buttons are all the same because I'm using, again, a defined color here. Um, but if I want to pass it a property, I can do so by just defining that property in a pair of brackets. So uh, in this case, I'm going to pass it a color property. And I'm going to replace the colors in here with that variable. And you're probably wondering, like, oh, what's this cool darken thing? Um, that is what's called a SAS function. So there's some functions in SAS that already exist uh, that you can take advantage of. One of those is darken and lighten. And then you can pass it a couple properties, like color, and then how much you want to darken or lighten it by. Um, and it makes creating uh, variations on a single color value really useful and helpful um, and reusable. So uh, now that I passed it uh, a value, I need to define that value here. And this button works fine. Um, but these buttons still have sort of the wrong background color. So I can reuse this. And it's now become dynamic, right? It's going to take this color value that I pass it and put it in in place of not only the background color, but also the hover color. So if I remove this, now my alert button goes dark red, right? It darkens it by 10%. So we can take advantage of the fact that we can pass arguments to our, uh, our mixins, uh, and then I'll put those, uh, and I'll put those uh, pretty easily. Um, so useful things for this, um, colors, background colors, uh, when you're defining, you can create a reusable mixin uh, for buttons. I do it all the time. Uh, specific boxes, uh, font styles, um, and easing is a great example. Easing, you can pass it three different properties, right? The transition, um, the time, and um, the uh, easing type. And you can see, uh, you can output those things with a bunch of vendor prefixes. So Compass already has a library of mixins for CSS3 properties. Uh, Compass, you can think of as an extension to SAS. It sort of runs um, in sort of it's almost like an additional kind of library that you have access to, but it has a compiler built in. So uh, if you're using the Compass app, you just use that Compass app, and all of a sudden, if you put in some 
import statements uh, to the Compass libraries, then you have access to like all of the mixins that they have. Um, this is their documentation page. You can actually generate like a new Compass slash SAS project uh, using uh, this page just by filling in sort of these little, I have an existing Compass Rails or other project with what kind of sheets and it'll, you just hit go and it'll generate for you a little folder with all of the stuff in it for you. Or sorry, it, um, it'll tell you what to just paste into the command line. Um, there are tools online that will just generate a folder for you as well. Um, I posted a bunch of my favorite variables and mixins that I use on GitHub. Uh, again, they're in the presentation. Uh, it's basically things like hiding elements and showing elements. Um, there's a really good one for font sizing that I use, uh, but it can also be used for um, any kind of sizing. Uh, not just specific to fonts. I use it for fonts all the time, but it uses uh, REMS. Uh, things like background colors, uh, using SVG images with backups, P backup PNGs uh, for retina screens and stuff like that. Um, pretty much anything you can think of, like any task that you want to do with CSS3 or CSS, uh, and you just Google that with the word mix in, you'll probably find something that someone's written. It might not be good, but you'll probably find something. Uh, and uh, you can tweak it or use it um, and create some pretty cool stuff. I've seen mix-ins that uh, actually make, you can do just pure CSS3 parallax scrolling just using uh, a SAS mix-in. So you write at include, and then you write what level you want the item to be on, and you just nest it on the selector. SAS also has cool functions. Like I said earlier, um, that darken function that you saw, um, that we can take advantage of. So the most popular and widely used functions are ones that modify colors uh, or do some sort of math. So you can actually perform math in SAS as well. So if you want to say, like, I want the width of this to be 100% minus 2M, like, you can do that with SAS. You can do that with the calc value also in CSS3, um, but it's not really supported the same way. Um, there's a link to all of the functions that exist. So um, like RG, there's opacity functions and scale and color, like there's giant, I won't go through this. But you can look at it <laughs> later. Um, like I said earlier, if you wanna use a variable in a selector or a property name, so when I say property name, I'm talking about um, these guys here. Uh, in place of that, you need to use that syntax that I talked about with the hashtag and the curly brackets with your, uh, with your variable in slide. Otherwise, if it's a property value, um, it's fine to just use the dollar sign by itself, okay? Some compilers will just compile it anyway. Some will throw an error. So it really depends on the compiler, but best practice is to do it this way. The last syntax thing that we're gonna talk about today is extend. Uh, which lets you extend um, a shared set of CSS properties from one selector to another. So if you have an existing CSS selector um, defined, like a class name, and you want to just take all of the stuff that's inside that and put it into another place on your style, uh, in your SAS file, you can do that. Um, it helps keep your SAS really dry. So an example of that would be I've defined a button class already Again, this is really similar to like, you could create a mix-in for this too. But uh, if you're actually using the button class in your HTML, why create a mix? Like, I don't know, it's up to you how you do things. There's no right or wrong way. Um, it's really just what works for your project, right? And what makes sense to you. Uh, and then we can extend that class um, and all of its sort of value uh, values in there uh, into another selector. So. Uh, just by writing at extend and then the name of the selector itself, right? So basically we're taking all of this stuff and we're just throwing it into there. Yeah. So like kind of, there's places, I'm gonna get into why this is useful. Um, say for example, like you have a clear fix class already predefined in a normalized file. There's no reason why you would need to then create a mix in for clear fix. Right? It's already in your normalize file or some kind of reset file that you have. So you can just call that class with an add extend anywhere you want in your page on any, on any selector, right? So you're not having to rewrite CSS. 
So that's like my, that would be my use case. Um, another use case uh, is using placeholders. So placeholders um, are uh, selectors that um, basically they're essentially class names that SAS doesn't output. So you can define a list of uh, value pairs and it will, property value pairs, uh, and you can use extend, but the actual placeholder class itself won't get output into your CSS file. Um, so you can be unsemantic in your CSS and semantic in your HTML, which depending on what you're doing can be okay. <laughs> so again, a clear fix example here is if you actually hate the term clear fix and you don't want to use it anywhere in your HTML, but you still need to use the properties of clear fix, you can define it like this, right? You can put a percentage sign and then the selector and then extend that, um, extend that placeholder. And then that way you're not actually using or defining a placeholder or a clear fix class anywhere in your CSS, but you're using the properties of that class. You could do this with a mix in too, right? So it, it's really up to you how you want to do it. Um, but yeah, it's <laughs> both ways work. So how would we convince our team uh, to get on board? You probably have a guy named Jared <laughs> who's not a happy dude. He doesn't like change. He just hates it. He doesn't like learning new things. He's comfortable. At your next meeting with Jared, you can say a couple of different things to him. You want to bring SaaS into your workflow. Um, we can tell Jared, SaaS simplifies development and lowers complexity. How does it do that? It might complicate your workflow at first, but it's a one-time cost. Right? You're, it's going to take a little bit of time to set up and figure out the logistics of it, but once you have it set up and you've learned it, and you guys, we've gone through pretty much all the syntax in less than 30 minutes, so it's not like a huge overhead, um, you know it, and you've implemented it once, and it's going to be a lot easier to implement it any other time that you start another project. Right? You've already set up all the file structure, everything like that, you know how to do it. So it's a one-time cost, but the benefits are, are really helpful helps make things more consistent. If you boil everything down, like every concept in SAS down to sort of its core, it's really there for consistency's sake. If we look at variables, like the whole purpose of variables is to make your colors or whatever you're defining more consistent throughout your site, right? Um, look at mixins. You're using the same properties over and over again. It helps create a um, more consistent document. Tedious vendor prefixing can be streamlined with SAS. Um, so you can create mixins for uh, vendor prefixes, or you can use uh, extensions of, uh, uh, or you can use, um, sorry, sorry. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> my mind is going to mush now. Um, or you can use uh, external libraries like Compass to help you with vendor prefixes, um, or additional task runners and stuff like that to add in vendor prefixes afterwards. But SAS uh, can help you with vendor prefixing right away uh, without having to maybe learn grunt. Right? You can just use SAS and create some mixins for the vendor prefixes that you need, like border radius or whatever they may be. Uh, and it compresses and concatenates files to make our site faster. So we have our whole, all of our styles split up into all of these partials and we're importing them all into one style.scss, which means our browser only has to do one request to get that styles.scss file, not multiple requests to get multiple CSS files, right? And you have to remember, even if you're using at import with CSS, like in a CSS file, the browser, like you can use at import uh, in regular CSS files. That's uh, CSS3, I think it was before CSS3, but it's been in CSS for a while. Um, the browser still makes multiple, multiple requests, right? It's making a request every time it sees that import statement if you're doing it in a CSS file versus if you're doing it in a SAS file and then compiling to a minified CSS file, you're only serving up one piece of information, one file, and then that's it. And browsers eat CSS for breakfast, like they will rip right through it. So you don't have to worry about, oh my god, it's so big or bloated or whatever. It's that one CSS file is not going to make your site slow, right? It's all the images that you're loading on your site that's going to make it slow. And worst case scenario, uh, <laughs> you can always just sneak it in. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, worst case scenario, uh, you can just sneak it into your next project. You build it into the budget and try it out 
Uh, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then OK, then you abandon it and move on. But realistically, it's not that hard to set up. Um, and chances are uh, it, you'll really honestly see the benefits of it just working with it the first time. So how do we make that transition from regular CSS to SAS? Um, well, CSS files are valid SAS files. So realistically, if you have a CSS file, you can just change the file extension, and you have valid SAS all of a sudden. Yay. You're, you're pretty much there. Um, once you've done that, you can just replace all your colors with variables. And then you've already unlocked like a huge benefit to using SAS, right? When I first started using it, I was intimidated. I wasn't sure what I could do and what I would be able to learn. And so the, those are the things that I did. I made SAS files, and then I changed variables, like colors into variables. And already, that like made thing, my life so much easier. Um, because I could call on those variables and like darken or lighten colors based on a variable name and not have to worry about anything beyond that, right? Um, you can start to nest things, right? So look for logical groups in your existing CSS file and say, okay, I have box UL, box LI, box A. Well, I could put all of that stuff and just nest it, and all of a sudden it's three lines shorter and now super easy to read and indented, right? So you can go ahead and start to nest things. Next thing you could do is maybe convert CSS3 stuff into mixins. Um, so anytime that you have vendor prefixes, uh, maybe taking that, putting it into a mixin, and then just using the at include. Uh, that could be your next step into bringing it in. And the syntax only takes an hour to learn. So making the transition shouldn't be that hard. Um, what if you have a big team? Well, actually I'll get into that in a second. Wrong slide. <laughs> uh, common objections that you're gonna get uh, or misconceptions sort of about SAS. Uh, these are things that people bring up in meetings, why they can't use it or why you can't use a CSS preprocessor. Um, SAS makes everything bloated. It's huge and gigantic and it's gonna make my site slow or something. I don't know, people say this. It's on the internet somewhere on a Reddit thing, I'm sure. It does exactly what you told it to do. If you're writing crappy SAS that's outputting to crappy C that's because you're writing crappy SAS, right? Like, if you write good CSS, you can write good SAS. Um, it's only gonna do what you tell it to do, so if you nest things 100 times, you're gonna output 100, like, things that are nested 100 times, and it's gonna be pretty messy, right? So it'll only do exactly what you tell it to do. So write your SAS how you would write your CSS. Right? It's pretty easy to imagine what your CSS output will be, and if you're not sure, just go and look after it's compiled and make sure it's what you want. Um, but write your SAS how you want your CSS to output. It's going to make my workflow too complicated. It's a one-time cost, right? Once you set up, it's a lot easier to continue with every project afterwards. Um, it could actually make your workflow better. If you're not using a preprocessor, chances are you're probably not taking advantage of some of the tools that come with preprocessors, like Live Reload and CSS injections. So style injections and watching files for changes with uh, an app like Live Reload is super helpful because then you don't have to go back to your browser and refresh every time. You wanna see a style change that you've made. It automatically changes. Right? So there's certain benefits that come with using SAS or a CSS preprocessor. Once you kind of enter into that realm of like these cool tools like Grunt and SAS and like all of these fancy newfangled things, um, there's lots of stuff that just kind of comes with it all, right? Because if you're using one, chances are you're going to be sort of stepping on another, and it'll just kind of fall in place, hopefully. <laughs> it's only for big sites, and I'm working on tiny projects. If you care about performance and you care about consistency on a big site or a small site, why wouldn't you use something like this, right? It's gonna make, whether or not your project's large or small, it'll make it more consistent, it'll make it faster, <clears throat> right? Um, your authoring experience should be easy and comfortable, and using something like this is going to ideally help you to get to that point where you become so used to this that it's like horrifying to go back to regular, like writing regular CSS. Um, and I can attest to that. Some people will say it's harder to debug. I can't debug things. Like I said earlier, there's um, mapping. 
So there's source mapping. So uh, most of the pre-processing apps or most of those command line compilers have a source mapping option. So you just turn it on and it tells you the line in which your bug is. You don't have to run it through a validator to find out what line it's on. Off when you're gonna export the yeah, yeah. So like, um, oftentimes, uh, like I use Grunt for uh, most of my stuff. So uh, I'll have a command that I run that sort of compiles everything for production. Um, but then uh, you can just go into your config RB file and switch a couple things around, and then all of a sudden it's compiling for production. So. What if you don't like SAS and you want to go back to CSS and now all your files are SAS files and you're like, crap. You can just output the CSS fully expanded with comments and then just use those files, right? It, like even if you end up not liking it, all the different preprocessors that are out there will compile back to CSS and you can just take those files and just use them, right? So even if you end up just hating it, you can go back. It's not a big deal. It takes too long to learn. This is the slide that I kind of screwed up earlier. Um, well, you just learned it in less than an hour. And what if your team is so big? I have so many people on my team, right? I'm a team on a team with a lot of people. Then it's one hour times however many people you have on your team, right? It's going to be, or just stick all those people into a room, and then it's still one hour, right? OK, that's it. We've made it. We're done. Um, these are uh, the resources, so the mix-in variable um, <clears throat> repo that I talked about, my slides, uh, and all the code pens uh, that I showed today. And do you guys have any questions? I'll go back because somebody was taking a picture. 